people were coming. Oh, how lovely to actually to see all these nice people. Thank you. Okay, um, okay. apologies for a, a little bit of a rush just here at the last minute. Um, I'm Helen Hollick. Um, quickly to use Helen Hart, Richard Denning, and Kathy Helms. Um, we're here to talk about independent publishing, which is sort of what we now call self-publishing. Uh, I think the difference is self-publishing really is you do it all yourself. Independent publishing is basically you get somebody to help you, possibly, um, as with Helen Hart, assisted publishing. Um, one of the things that they are battling against, of course, is the fact that there's still quite a stigma against indie publishing, self-publishing. A lot of people still look down on it as oh, well, yes, if it's self-published, it must be because it's not a very good book. Um, yeah, it's because they haven't made it as mainstream. They're all over rubbish and not worth reading. And we're here to prove the opposite of that. Um, independent books are, can be just as good as mainstream and actually, in some cases, even better. The main thing is, though, that if you are going to go independent publishing, you've got to do it properly. Um, there's some chairs up here. Don't rush, we were late ourselves, so we can't. <laughs> it's such a trek to this corner of the building. It seems to be getting farther and farther away. Yes. Yes. And more and more stairs. <laughs> 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 what do you mean by doing it properly? That's what this right. talk is going oh, to entail. Okay. So um, yes. that's, that's what your hour is, is to sort of talk to you about the differences between. Um, doing something that may be a little bit more amateur, but or to do it what we call properly to compete on on the same level playing field as um, authors published by the mainstream. Uh, gosh, we need more chairs, don't we? Yes. There's one over here. Yeah. 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 Sorry. No, don't worry. We've only just started ourselves, so don't worry. <laughs> Child of Loki. <gasps> oh. hmm. One thing we will say, uh, what we really do want from you is ask questions. Because obviously we can sit here chatting away and we're not actually asking, you know, answering what we want to know. So feel free to ask questions. Yeah, it's going to be a bit talk first. Yeah, so we're just giving a small presentation. Together. Then after that, we really want your questions so that it's more interesting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You don't want to listen to us, do you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was mainly published um, by Matthew Collins. Um, the historical novels took a little bit of a nosedive not long ago, uh, a few years ago. Humphrey Collins decided that he was not to publish my backlist. I got dropped. Um, I spent two weeks sobbing because I thought that was the end of my career. And then I decided, this is silly, I've got nothing to prove. I might as well self publish my books. Um, I went to an assisted publisher who, as it turned out, wasn't very good because they are now bankrupt and owe money all over the place. Um, so, second nosedive for my career. But fortunately, I knew the lovely Helen Hart <laughs> <laughs> with Silverwood Books. And um, I think my books here are fabulous because they look quality. Um, I mean, this one, how the king, this one, the king making. They look quality from the outside. They are quality on the inside. Um, properly produced, which I think you know, Helen's going to talk about anyway. Um, I think one of the things we are going to talk about is the importance of editing, the importance of production. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to pass you over to Helen. As you should start. Oh, Richard, Richard. sorry. <laughs> we planned all this. Yeah. Richard, 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 Richard Denning um, literally self-publishes. Um, he's got got your own publishing company, yeah. produce your own books. Over to Richard. <laughs> So I've just actually, I think there's a thing come around, which is a sort of outline of what I do myself. I, I, I publish um, through Mercy Books, which is, which is me. Um, so I set up my own publishing um, company. Um, and I print them via Lightning Source, um, which also I think you use as well, don't you? Um, very, very good um, quality uh, sort of printers. Um, and that's what I do. Now, uh, I 
That means, obviously, entirely doing the whole production essentially yourself, but with, but with help. So the first thing is I, I have an editor, um, so an editor actually that, um, that Helen uses, um, and so I get it properly, professionally edited. Uh, I, I lay out the manuscript myself, um, but I mean, I've been using in, InDesign to, to actually do the layout of it, rather than just doing it in Word. My originally was doing it in Word, um, but I've um, learned you can, uh, you can do it better um, you know, by InDesign. Well, there are other um, software products, I'm sure Helen will expand on that. Um, and uh, then I need a cover, so I, I go to Cathy at the end there to, to, get, my, to get my covers um, done for me. Um, Lightning Source will only deal with you if you are a publisher, so you can't just go to them as an author and say, hey, will you print my books? You have to be a publisher, but to be a publisher, you just go to Nielsen and pay your hundred and whatever it is pounds and get your ten ISBNs and you are then a publisher. Uh, even then, Lightning Source will try and persuade you to go to Lulu or Create Space or one of the other um, companies where you can just upload your, your manuscript. And that's, in fact, what I did in the very beginning, about three years ago when I started on this journey. Um, and I've sort of moved on, moved on from there. Uh, <coughs> but providing you can handle the technical side of laying out manuscripts, you can produce you know, um, the, the PDFs that are needed at a certain term, you know, professional level, then Lightning Source will, will deal with you. And they distribute to Amazon um, and several other places, I think, as well, don't they? All over the world, well, all over the world basically. So that means you, your books will turn up on all the various book sites and things as, as, a, as buyable. And I think because they supply them, generally speaking, quite often they'll turn up as, as in stock, um, quite often, rather than showing several weeks. I think it takes a while for that to happen. Anyway, so that's, that's, that's what I do. Um, I, it is, there is quite a steep learning curve to the whole, the whole process. Um, and when I look back at some of my early efforts of two or three years ago, they're fairly embarrassing, to, to be honest. Uh, the covers are terrible, the formatting's wrong. I was very fortunate to meet, to meet Helen uh, here um, online um, well, about two and a half years ago or something. And she sort of read one of my books and uh, said it didn't completely suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said you needed a lot of polishing. Yes. <laughs> but that, that convinced me of the need to get an editor um, and, and also start to produce better, better quality, better, better produce, professionally done, or as professional as possible. It's still I'm learning, still, still now, I mean, um, Helen Harty had a look at the book and said, oh, you could do with having the, these numbers down a bit over here, or slightly, slightly improve the, the layout, but so it's a learning curve which is going to continue, I'm sure, for a while. But the, end, the benefits of doing it yourself are, I suppose, you've got complete control over everything. Um, you can decide on whether you like the cover or not. If you don't, you go back to your <laughs> book cover person and say, I want to redesign, let's go, let's go for a different style. Um, so you're in control, um, which, uh, which is a good thing. But you do have to do everything yourself. So that's all, you know, obviously, everyone has to do marketing these days, but there's, a, there's a quite a, an effort required to sort of get things off the ground and, and start getting you know, some, some sales and some reviews and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I've, I've enjoyed it and uh, I think I'm just starting to feel like I'm making progress. <laughs> it's ticking over of sales and things, and uh, particularly on e-books, um, which uh, probably will be you know, at least half the sales, if not more. Um, so, yeah, that's what I do. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Helen Hart, Um, I come from a writing background, so I've been a published writer since uh, 1999. Um, I've written eight novels, which have been published by HarperCollins, Scholastic, Oxford University Press, most of them historical fiction for teens. Um, in 2007, I started Silverwood Books, which is uh, my company, um, and I did that because some of my friends were self-publishing, and what they were showing me that they were producing, not themselves, they were buying the services of companies, which I felt were very, very substandard. They weren't books that you would ever see in a, in a mainstream bookshop. They were probably only saleable to those people's immediate family, their mums, and they were only buying them because they loved them. Um, so I thought there is a gap in the market for a company that actually produces books that look as if they, they had been produced by HarperCollins and by Penguin, and that's, that's what we produce. Um, and 
I felt that because I had been a writer, I knew what the job entailed um, and I could offer the relevant support through the whole process um, because it, it's not just about writing, it's, it's about the whole producing the product and selling it at the end. I'm also involved with the Bristol Short Story Prize as a judge. Um, I'm on the Historical Novel Society Indie Review team and I run um, a masterclass with a colleague from um, who was formerly at Random House um, and we run a class in Bristol called Get Published Masterclass where we talk to people about the right way to approach literary agents and how to polish their submission package. Do you do that by, um, e e like, can you do that online? No, but we have talked about perhaps doing webinars because we realised that 20 people sat in a room was quite a limited audience and actually if we did webinars, you know, the world is at our stage um, as long as we get time zones. Not right. easy for somebody from Canada to come to... Mm, no, no. Um, yeah, I think we'll do that. Um, what, what I want to cover today is what I think are the four keys to success as an indie or self-published author. There are hundreds of factors which will affect your success, but obviously we've only got a, a limited time. My slot is just over five minutes and I'm bound to run over because there's too much to say. Um, so I'm, I've just narrowed it down to the four keys and I think those are, one, you must have a high quality product that people want to read and that's really important and, and I say product. Um, uh, because publishing is an interesting area in which um, the, it, it meets, it's where creativity meets the commercial world. So we're all artists um, and we are creating our magnum opuses, opi, um, but actually we need to accept that we're entering the commercial world and we need to know how that works and how to do it. So when I say high quality product, that's high quality in all areas. It must be well written. That's obvious to all of you here and I, I know that you all know that. Um, people have touched on the professional proofreading and editing, both Richard and Helen have mentioned that, and that's, uh, that's absolutely vital. The interior of your book needs to be professionally typeset. Um, even with an e-book, it still needs to be professionally formatted, because I'm, I must say I'm fed up of getting um, e-books on my Kindle, and the, the type size changes halfway through, and that's okay, because I can go in and I can make mine a different size, but it's frustrating when you're halfway through a really good part of the story, or suddenly everything shifts over and it's only reading on the right-hand side of the screen. So the high-quality typesetting and preparation is important. You must have a professional book jacket design, which I won't go into detail because I know Cathy's going to talk about that because she's the expert in that field. Um, but I, I would say that it needs to be appropriate for your genre and for the marketplace as well. So even though, as a self-publisher, um, you have the ultimate control, you have total control over your work, you still need to listen to what the professionals are saying because what you love as a book jacket may be completely different to what your readers are expecting and a lot of your success is going to be about meeting readers' expectations. So your book in your genre needs to look like a lot of the other books in your genre, not stereotyped. You can go down a different pathway, but it needs to have certain colour cues, um, a palette of colours, it's very obvious, but detective novels, black, red writing, a um, bit of white somewhere. Um, so think about your genre and how your jacket needs to look and take the advice of the experts. Um, and it's important that you appropriately print your book. Um, print on demand has given us all massive freedom. We can print literally one book at a time, so we don't need to warehouse a bedroom full of books that we, we hope to um, sell. And print on demand allows you to sell right out into the global marketplace. However, because it's a very streamlined service, the printer is literally printing one book at a time, you only get a certain finish to the cover, matte or gloss, and you can only use a certain type of paper, either cream or white. Um, if you want something that has beautiful photographs in it, um, uh, colour plates, something that's perhaps more of the biography market, um, let's just see where are the colour plates, you can't go the print on demand route, so you'll have to deal with a printer who can put a, put a book together um, with, with the appropriate um, plate sections um, and specialist papers really. Uh, so that's the first key, it's the high quality product. The second is an understanding of the publishing industry and the marketplace you're entering. It's an extremely competitive. There are 32 million books in print right now, and that doesn't include self-published and indie titles. So that shows you what you're up against. It, it's, it's extremely competitive. So you need to know how to operate in that competitive market. There aren't necessarily loads of people out there waiting to bite your hand off for your book. You need to find your marketplace, you need to know how to target them, you need to know how, how to get, get your work out into the market. You need to understand trade discounts and how the retail sector works. 
Um, and that's really important, um, especially the trade discounts are very important because that affects your profit line. And while profit, I would say, should be fairly low on your list of priorities, because if you're very realistic, you should be doing it for other reasons, for the enjoyment, for sharing your story. Um, profit's, gonna, profit's not necessarily given when you're self-publishing or indie publishing. So that's your second point, understanding of, of the publishing industry. Third, you need the energy and the relentless drive to engage with your readers online and offline. Um, because it is up to you to sell your book. Even if you're with a mainstream publisher now, you still have to get out there and sell your book and engage with your readership. And that brings me very nicely to the fourth point, which is I believe that you do need ebook and paperback editions. Everybody's very excited about ebooks now. Oh, it's so easy, I can put it on Smashwords, I can put it on Amazon Kindle. But actually, if you want to be taken seriously as an author, um, I think it's having a, a hard <coughs> print copy is an indication of, that you can be taken seriously. Um, it under, underscores your credibility as an author. And also it opens opportunities for, for you. Um, there are no, uh, no mainstream authors here. I didn't see Bernard Cornwell flogging his e-book and, and trying to get you to buy it. In the future, and possibly now, people will be there looking at the hard copy and secretly buying it on their iPad or Kindle. And I think that will take off. But right now, the majority it is, uh, people are queuing up to buy the print books. Um, so those opportunities for you as an author are doing talks, doing signings, um, holding events, being at festivals, being at conferences. You can't really go there and say, hey, hey I'm here, I've written an e-book, here's a little card with a Q code on it, go and buy my e-book. You want to be there with your book, you want to put it in people's hands. That's the one of the most important things you can do as an indie author. Put your book in somebody's hand because there's something very um, attaching about holding a book, seeing the quality and thinking, yeah, actually this sounds like my sort of thing, I'm going to head to the tills and buy it. Um, and that, I'm going to wrap up very quickly with my, my final bit. Um, obviously Richard does everything himself and that's absolutely brilliant and, and I love what he said about um, the steep learning curve. And I think Richard has always been very open to taking advice and listening to what people are saying to him. And he always says, yeah, yeah, actually, they, the books at the beginning weren't as good as they could be. Um, a lot of people choose not to do that because it is a huge learning curve and the pitfalls are very expensive. They are expensive mistakes to make. Um, so some people choose to use a company and that's where Silverwood Books comes in. Um, and I'm not here just to plug Silverwood Books. There are lots of other companies but the key thing that I want to say is that not all companies are the same. Um, there are some extremely unscrupulous operators out there, and you need to do as much research as you can um, before you choose to use them. How, how, uh, how do you do that? Because that is a very difficult question. I will tell you. <laughs> but the first thing, the advantages of using a company, if you're self-publishing and doing everything yourself, then you do get that sense of huge satisfaction. Yeah, I did it all myself. Le learned lots of, lots of things along the way and made lots of mistakes. Um, I feel that the advantage that we offer people and companies like us offer people are that writing, and I know myself, it's a solitary business. You do it on your own. You're on your own all day. You go a little bit mad, a little bit cabin um, crazy. What a company like mine does is we are there at the end of the phone. We are offering the support. We're holding your hand through the whole process. You've always got someone to bounce ideas off of, and you're um, taking advantage of our technical expertise. So we, on the whole, we do make mistakes sometimes, but on the whole, we get it right pretty much the first time. So if you've only got one book, or you've got an extremely demanding day job, which I know Richard also has because he's a GP and I don't know how he fits it all in. Um, if you don't want to do it all yourself, then you've got something that you can just say, here's my manuscript, make me a beautiful book. We do tend to get it right the first time. We do produce beautiful books um, and we have a knowledge and understanding of the industry. So you don't necessarily have to, but if you want the knowledge, we can share it with you. Can I ask um, an Australian question? Yeah. And how much would setting up and cost be? I think, should we go into that afterwards? That, that's, that's a really good question, but if I divert, then I'm oh, sorry, sorry. way over my yeah. five minutes. Yeah, yeah, um, so with, with a company, uh, there's no expensive pitfalls, but you do have to choose the right company, and that's the thing that I think you really need to do your research. You need to uh, find out about their reputation, you need to look at the quality of the books, you need to look at the quality of their website. If there are typos on their website, how carefully are they going to be looking at your work? You need to check your contract, ask for a sample contract, read it through, show it to somebody else that you trust. 
check the termination clause. Can you walk away if you want to? Some companies will tie you in for a period of two years, five years, and you can't do anything else with your work. That's not self-publishing, and actually that's not right. Um, who owns the copyright to, to the, the text and the jacket, and do you retain your own rights, or is the publisher somehow buying some sort of right that means you are stuck with them even if the relationship breaks down? Um, check out the remuneration, what kind of royalty and remuneration structure is there, and make sure that you're very clear about um, how the money that you've earned is going to come to you, how often, um, how trade discounts are factored in. Um, and then very, very briefly, ask them about book promotion. Do they do promotional work? What are the fees? Are the fees reasonable? You should expect to pay. Doing your own promotion um, is always beneficial because you're always the best ambassador for your book. Sometimes it's nice to buy in some extra support services, but make sure that, there's the, that what you're buying is targeted to your specific readership. Some companies I know just put adverts in places and they're completely, the, the readers of that person's book, and they're never going to see that advert, and yet that person's paid a couple of hundred pounds for an advert that is virtually useless. So make sure that you ask really tough questions. And finally, as a self-publishing author, um, one of the keys to success, actually, so there are five, not four, is remember that you're running a business. So keep all your receipts and records, all your expenses can be offset against tax. If there's a profit, you do need to, to declare it on your tax return, um, but try and balance your expenditure against income. And usually, for most of us, we can we can you know put all those expenses and go, oh, actually, sorry, taxman, I've not made any profit this year. So that I'm aware that I've sort of gabbled and gabbled and gabbled, and there will be time for questions afterwards. But now, uh, shall I hand over to Kathy? Are you perhaps yes, going to take I'll over? Be the, the, um... <laughs> no, don't be brief. Because I think what you do is really important, so don't be too brief. Go ahead. Isn't there one uh, area, I, I think, I know in the States, but I'm sure you can get it over here. Do you sh does it show up on editors and predators when you, if you, you know, like you ran, I know of one small press that ran into the debacle that you were talking about, just all of a sudden, poof, and there you were along with your books and all. And, but you can check them through editors and predators, some things you don't need. the bad ones end up on there, actually. I think there's more of an emphasis on the negative. We're certainly not on there. As right, far as right. I know. But I mean, you know, and I think right. that's because because uh, a couple of a couple of clients have said to me, I can't find anything bad about you on the internet. And I said, Well, that's because because <laughs> 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 yeah. we're nice people. We deal yes. honestly, and that's what you're looking for in the company that you use. You want people with integrity and honesty that are going to tell you the truth up front. We're not going to make hyperbolic claims about you're going to make all these ma ma massive sales and you're going to earn your living. I'm always very much lowering the expectations. And a lot of people find that quite disappointing when I say, you may only sell a couple of hundred copies. Um, you shouldn't be in it for the profit. So that's, that's the sort of mm -hmm. company that you want. So I don't think we are... So we, no, what I'm saying is, if, they do sh if you do show up there... Do that research. Warning. That shouldn't be the only warning, place you warning. do research. Ask, ask, ask to get around as well. Yeah, ask, ask to, around, authors ask that to talk yeah. to previous yeah. authors. If they won't put you in touch with previous authors, why not? Yeah. We're always very yeah. happy to yes. pass on um, yes, email addresses and get our authors talking. And we run a forum on Facebook so we can get all our authors in there sharing tips and, and talking. So anyway, I don't want to big up Silver Books because Kathy runs an independent um, graphic design business doing doing covers and we've worked with Kathy on um, quite a lot of Helen's books and, and um, some of our own films which is always a joy to work with. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I am Kathy Helms and a uh, business I run under is Avalon Graphics. Uh, the first thing I would like to stress is whoever told you that you can't judge a book by its cover lied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You can have a brilliantly written book, brilliantly put together on the inside, and if you have a clip art and boring text on the front, no one's going to pick it up. No one's going to take a chance on it, or not likely, other than your friends and family. So you really do want to capture the attention of a potential reader as they're browsing through a Kindle, a bookstore, or whatever it may be. Uh, for example, for Harold the King, it's a strong, bold color. The typography is proper for the time, which was 1066. It isn't done in Comic Sans for children with a balloon on the front or something. You know, it's very appropriate for the subject matter. And these are a lot of things that authors don't necessarily take a lot of time on themselves. So I urge you to find someone you trust you can work with that will talk to you about what would be appropriate for your book and how to best represent it. 
visually across the board and where you want to put it, your website, blogs, Twitter, Facebook, you should always have a good visual presentation of your book as well as what's inside. So uh, how I got into this business, I am a uh, graphic designer and I wasn't sure when I, think when I earned my degree, I wasn't sure which direction I was going to go into, but I'm also an avid reader, particularly historical fiction. So I read Helen's books and fell in love with it and reached out to her as, as a fan. We struck up a conversation. She asked me what I did for a living, and I said, well, I'm a graphic designer. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do, and she asked me if I did book covers. She just happened to be going through the phase where she was losing that second publisher, was looking, talking to Helen Hart, and beginning the whole publishing process again. So I sent her, do you have see what check? Uh, she gave me a chance, or gave me a chance to design this cover, and I did. And we've had a strong working relationship, friendship ever since. <laughs> but I've gotten into book cover design, and I absolutely love doing it. And that's half the battle too: is to find a designer who truly enjoys what they do, uh, who works with you and listens to you, and you can have good discussions about what works, what doesn't work. Uh, a designer should be willing to try different things for you. You shouldn't work with someone who says, well, this is the way it has to be, and that's it. It is very important to work with your designers. You need to form a small team. You need a, you know, a professional editor and a designer to help you best get your book out there in the public's eye. And that's it in a nutshell, but I'm happy to discuss in any detail any questions that you may have about design. Sorry, if, um, sure. I, when I pick up something like that, I it feels so different to this is something I just brought downstairs. I mean, as soon as I pick that up, I'm sort of feeling to myself, this is not published by a traditional publisher. Um, how do we avoid that? Because I actually went to I don't feel awful to me. I went to a friend's book launch, and um, she she actually um, self-published. And um, she, because she wanted to keep the cost down, um, her book was 100,000 words, but she compressed it, and it was so, actually it turns really, this, yeah, it turns really nicely, so you can see it was laid out. But she made some really wrong choices with layout and everything like that, but still, it's got that feel. Are you talking about the weight of the book? It's the, the maybe it's just the... You do have choices. choices. Yeah. There are choices. Try that, you're looking at a matte book. Try yeah. that one. That yeah. one. This is a very large book. Yeah. You know, Helen writes the most amazing, gripping stories that come for a whole lot of pages. The reason why it feels different is because the printing is different. It's printed on right. different paper. Yeah. That book, um, and most of the books here, yeah. have been printed um, using print-on-demand. Yeah. So um, before you came in, we talked about the streamlining of the process. Um, if you feel the paper of your book and that book, yeah. you think the paper yeah. is similar. We, there, are, there are constrictions around the sort of books that you can use and the paper that you yeah. use. Um, print-on-demand has huge advantages yeah. for your visibility as authors all around the world. If you want a book like that, you can get a book like that. You would choose a life graphic yeah. printer. You would have a thousand uh, minimum copies printed. You can go to Short Run Digital, which takes you down to 250, 500 copies. But um, if the cost sort of goes up a little bit on a per copy basis. If you have a thousand copies printed, yes, your book will look like that but it won't be available all over the world. Because a lithographic printer doesn't have the distribution deal that Lightning Source, the print-on-demand printer, has. So you will have a 1,000 books in your bedroom, which is the size of an average washing machine. Yeah. Two average washing machines. Yeah, 500 works. books is about the size and weight of an average washing machine. So you need to put it over a joist, you need to store it correctly, um, you need a warm and dry room. But that book, that book, goes out into the world because that's a mainstream publisher who's got a massive distribution deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can get their books into bookshops all over the world. Yeah. One of the things that you're, you're all going to face is the reality that you can't do that. You yeah. don't have the distribution might. You've got higher production costs, higher overheads. You simply can't offer 60% discount and get your book into all the waterstones in the country. Um, I'm clocking you and I, I'll <laughs> forget um, So you do have to weigh up what's important to me. Yeah. Um, Am I happy with a book like this? And I think it's good. I think it would be good to. Do you mind if we pass yeah. some of your books yeah. around as well? Um, to actually have a sort of. Yeah, really paying attention to the inside. Yeah. <laughs>
you're going to see um, more and more because as publishers need to cut their costs and cut their warehousing in particular, they're, they're going to use print-on-demand more. Um, and actually, most, I have to say, I've never heard someone before say, oh, this doesn't feel like a real book. Um, that, to, to me, they do. The paper is a little bit smaller. Um, shall I just go to this gentleman? There, there, there is probably a question rather than observation about size of books uh, yeah. I've heard I, I'm some, one of the agents I pitched to asked me how big my book is at the moment I have to say I want to tell you it's about 200,000 words <gasps> yeah but you see it's 200,000 words <laughs> and he said no you've got, to, you've got to cut that in half now if I cut that in half it destroys the book I'm, I'm, I actually believe in lean writing but the story is I, if I cut it down considerably I will cut it down but there comes a point where if you cut it down, you destroy it. So the question is, do you set a limit, a word limit, that says, if it's bigger than that, you want to do it? And if so, why? Yeah. How do you justify it? Um, have a look at um, David Ebsworth. It's economics. And no. I'll let Helen answer. And I want to I'll answer economics. economics. I've been in the same position as you. With, with one of my books that was taken by source books, they wanted me to cut it by 40,000 words. Um, From what to where? Uh, uh, it was about the same. It was about 170,000 words, I think. Yeah, so asking, asking me to cut 40,000 words was quite a lot. But actually, I edited it through, and I actually found it quite easy. Because you cut out all the... All the uh, it was a bright, sunny day. <laughs> you cut out the word bright. You know, so that helps. Um, but don't yeah, you think you know, on your writing style? Because yeah. But, writing but actually, it, so what I found it didn't because okay. I cut through. But I do agree with you. There were quite a few things I left in because it would change the book. The other thing you do have to bear in mind with being self-published, independent publishing, is that you do pay by the word, you do pay by length. Mm -hmm. And if you do come to conferences like this, you have to know what Richard thinks about it. Just bear in mind, the longer they are, if you're going to go independently, it will cost more. Yeah, I, I'm, and of course, that also means that the book itself costs yeah, more. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a yeah. businessman. But fine. It, I'm a day job of a businessman, yeah. so the problem is I, I understand about uh, profitability, I understand it's a business, I understand all of that. But in, the in point addition is, though, profit, is, 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 I'm not arguing for having over long books, I'm quite mm -hmm. ruthless with it. But some books are naturally 90,000 yeah. words long, some books are pillars of the earth. You know, yes. I'm not putting myself in the same level as Ken Follett, but there comes a point where they create it off. That if you try and shoehorn it too much, you destroy it. Yes. So, from my point of view, is where do I say I'm not? You know, is it reasonable to say, well, I, I either don't use that sort of publisher, or I pay more? Or do you have a, an arbitrary level? Is what I'm saying. Do you say if it's no. more than 880,000 words, I will lose it? The Lightning Source will print up to a thousand word book. Right. But what you're looking at is the cost for you. And I'd, I'd like to use the Jacobite's Apprentice as an, as an example there. Um, we did the very best we could to reduce Dave's costs as much as possible. Because he could, at the minimum, he, I think, um, what's the, the price on the back of that? Is it £17.99? Mm -hmm. That's the only way he can make a profit with that book, is by charging £17.99. Most people are not happy to pay that, so it's quite hard for him to sell that book. When he goes into Waterstones, Waterstones aren't happy to stock it, because they say, mm, if it was £18.99, we, we might be interested, but £17.99, we can't sell it. So it's not only that you're, you're affecting your own profitability, you're affecting your ability to actually sell through the, the retail market as it exists at the moment. If you think that all your sales are going to come from the fab website that you've got, which I think you should have, and a great blog that, that draws people to you, um, and you think that your audience will be happy to pay £17.99, plus the postage, that's another thing, you've got to watch some of that, it's heavy. Um, but, um, and the, and the other thing, just to con just to finish on David, um, I talked to him yesterday. He was one of the shortlisted Historical Normal Society um, short story competition um, people, and he said that his second book, 
he's learned so much from uh, being very, you know, it has to be the length it's going to be. And he said, actually, my second book, I have cut about 40,000 words out of it. It's much tighter, it's much better. And he said, in a way, the big book is my director's cut. But actually, my writing is better when I was given a you must cut 40,000. And when he did his pitch to the agents yesterday, they also said, the first word is how long is it? Because when they're selling it to publishers, publishers are thinking about the economics and how can we get this book out there. You've been waiting for ages. Yes, I got two questions. First question is when you when you do print on demand, the price actually goes up because if you look if you're gonna sell the Amazon it's a sixty percent discount cut on the on, on the actual cover price, which means that if it, if the print on demand is four fifty, then you have to cut it backwards to get to No, if you use print on demand you can set your own um, price, yeah. lightning source yeah. except a minimum twenty five percent. Amazon don't like it, well, but because the yeah. system works, they, okay, they so can accept so that. They will not get if you sign up to Amazon Advantage, yeah. which is usually your only way of getting onto Amazon if you use a LIFO print run, you do need to give 60%. Okay. Do, you need, uh, do, you, do you want to add something to that? Well, yeah, absolutely. The problem I had, I, I originally tried using Amazon Advantage and hit that exact problem that you, they are basically, you've got to give 60% off. So you think, well, hang on a minute. That means I've got to put the, the price up at... Too, too high. I'm still not happy about the, pro the RRP on there, which is 9.99. But I don't sell it at that when I sell it online myself or book fairs, uh, because it, only, it costs about four quid to, to print or something like that. But you have to do it at that point. You can give Amazon its its, its I don't understand because yeah. the print on the long book is a different rebate setting. Without that, is that what you're saying? You set when you set your title up within Lightning Source. You, you choose. You, put the you set. Right. We do 30 percent because we think it's it's. 25% is too low and it's really unattractive to the retail sector. I don't think you should really be offering less than 30% because most retailers just are not interested in taking it in that case. So you have to so say from the beginning that you will only get a 30% yeah. discount. Yeah. But because print on demand works, it's an efficient system, it, it, it exists. Your book, um, given a few hiccups in the first two or three weeks of when you put your book live, um, when it does show as not in stock, eventually it will show as in, in, in stock on Amazon. And they are they are doing the thirty percent. Um, okay. Can we? Can there's quite a lot of questions. Well, well, do you want to talk to me after, no, afterwards? Because there are people. There are lots of people. Okay, Should we do um, one question each? Okay. You can always come, come back, back to you. Still going to be here, so. Um, you, 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 you have a question? Yeah. Well, oh. Let's go round. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The, 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 the issue of, of setting the trade discounts with the light and sort Okay, very much. Well, well yeah. could I ask an alternative quick question? This is very, very wonkish. When you're when you're when you've been dealing with InDesign, the conversion to uh, EPUB and to uh, Kindle format, does that work? I, I don't. I don't take the InDesign file and convert. There are there are um, conversion programs you can get, or the drivers I think that'll take your InDesign and convert to the to the EPUB. But I don't do it that way. I start with my original Word document, and that Word document I'll take into InDesign for the for the print run, as it were, and I'll take in and I'll convert separately for the ebook thing. So I'll you know use the Word document and edit it, you know, reformat it for Smashwords and reformat it for Kindle. But you can take it through InDesign's thing, and they'll produce an ebook version. I've not tried that myself, though. Okay, um, my concern's always been that when I'm working with multiple multiple files, of edits yeah. get done on one edits get yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Be, I have millions of versions of things, and you just have to have a sort of system. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, we just do the InDesign. Right up to the point of print, then we e export from InDesign back into Word. We do a quick bit of formatting there, and then we convert from the Word file. So we know that our paperback ed edition okay. and our, yes, in our right. EPUB right. and Mobi editions are exactly the same. Because a number of big six ebook disasters have been related to the separation between mm -hmm. between their InDesign. I think you need to decide when you separate. And a lot of people say to me, "Oh, why can't I do my ebook first? And I say, well, because you always need to do all that, um, getting it into InDesign, doing your last minute edits. There are things you'll pick up at proof stage. You always need to go all the way to the point of print, and then you need to verge off to do the, the e-book. Thank you. Um, Who's next? Stand around this way. Sorry, I think it's lady over there. Okay. Oh, go around. Actually, I have a question which is not even for the panel. I wanted to know for the audience uh, how many people are already self-publishing? How many are you, of your wannabe self-publishers who have never been published? And how many are traditionally published people who are thinking of self-publishing? Well, sort of converting my published large prints to e-books. Um, 
Yeah, well, I, mean, I, 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 I live in the States, and I'm not um, English, but, you know, and over there, a lot of the authors I know, you know, there's traditionally published authors, often multi-published, who are now looking to publish the backlist, yeah. or publish new work um, mm. themselves. Which so, is, I think, which is where publishers are starting to fall down, because we have now got that independence. Mm. We don't have to rely on the publisher to keep our backlist in print. Um, we've got nothing to prove, we've had the backlist out, we get the rights back, yeah. publishing ourselves. Yeah. Um, one of these days publishers are going to wake up to it. <laughs> They're waking up. They're waking up. Yes, uh, so far you've spoken just about book production, which is all interesting. What about promotion, which is equally, if not more, marketing? Marketing. marketing promotion. It, is, it is essential. Um, I, I have come across quite a few independent authors who sort of say, oh yes, but I don't really like Facebook, I don't like Twitter, I don't really want to do all that. And um, my answer is, well, okay, so you don't want to sell your book. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is one of those things, you know, if you do, you need to get yourself out there, you do need to network. I know not everybody does like Facebook and Twitter and that, but it does sell books. It's very difficult, as Helen said, to get your book into bookstores. And even if your book is in a bookstore, how are people going to know that the book is in the bookstore? Um, and it's all very well, you know, some of these companies say, well, we will put, you know, we'll give you a website, we'll put the book on Amazon. Wonderful. How do people know the book is on Amazon? Along with 32 million okay, others, plus all yes. the published books. I do sell books through Facebook. Um, because my books are available you know, on Amazon, all around the world, the fact that I chat to people on Facebook, they're going to, you know, either buy it from Amazon or in America, they're going to Barnes & Noble. Oh, that's the lady I speak to on Facebook. I'll buy that book. Uh, same with Twitter and things like this. The main, really important thing, which I must emphasise to you, though, if you're on Facebook, on Twitter, Goodreads, any, anywhere for these networking sites, do not keep on and on about buy my book, buy my book, because that is the quickest way to lose sales, <laughs> believe me. You know, if I was to sort of, you know, I'm oh, bring your poses out, please buy bring your posts, and, and you can get it over and over again. If you've had a good look on Facebook and Twitter and you'll see it for yourself, buy my book, buy my book. Why should I buy your book? What you need to do is sell yourself. I always, I explain it like this, if you were going to a party where you don't know anybody, you don't go up to say, hi, I'm Helen, I write books. <laughs> you know, whoa, whoa, do you? You know, you have to go up and say, um, oh, hi, I'm Helen. Oh, I do like that dress. Where did you get that from? Uh, you know, or, oh, I don't know anybody here. Or, you know, what's the food like? You start the conversation, and then once you've got your conversation going, somebody will say, well, what do you do for a living? Oh, well, actually, I like books. Oh, do you? What do you like? You know, it, think of Facebook and Twitter conversation. Mm -hmm. Many of the, uh, I think Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and blogging is all um, the basics. But do any of you have any recommendations for other uh, uh, companies that do promotion? Do you have any recommendations? You can, but they are expensive. But can you recommend any? Okay. Personally, no, because I don't use them because they because they're so expensive. Um, I mean, I, I think I did look into one point a marketing company. You're talking about a month's worth of marketing, which I think I was close to something like two thousand dollars. And how, do you feel, how do you feel about blog tours? Blog tours are good. Mm -hmm. yeah, they really are. They're hard work. <laughs> Extremely hard work. What does I, that mean? Yeah, yeah. No, I was just a, a blog tour is basically, there is a lot of blogs on the internet that would do review books. So really what you would do is you send out some of the books <coughs> reviews, usually now, fortunately, on PDF, so you don't have to actually send the books. They'll possibly review the book, and then you'll literally do a virtual tour. Mm -hmm. They will review your book, possibly give you an interview, you can write an article about it. And I've done a blog tour that's been a whole month. So different reviews, different days, different places, different sites each day where I'm talking about my books and talking about you know, my interests and things like this. And they are hard work. But they are a lot of organisation. And you need to choose your blogger very carefully as well. You need to look at how many people are following them and what their following is interested in because, again, it comes down to genre. So um, pick, pick uh, you know, your six, ten, however, however many bloggers. Make sure that you're targeting the right audience that's beyond them. Uh, make sure that they are um, trusted bloggers as well um, so that the people that are reading the, the post about your book, they are all thinking, yeah, I trust this blogger, so if she says it's good, it's going to be good. They're not just you know, people that are just putting a penny on the book. 
um, make sure that your book is available as an e-book because even though there are links through to Amazon and the paperback, the e-books do turn, I think the e-books sound better on, yes. on blog tours. Yeah. Um, and be quite disciplined about it. Um, you, you also, you can't just go, oh, here, I'm on a blog tour. You need to be tweeting and Facebooking and getting all your following to repost. Oh, look, I'm here today. Post this link and, you know, I'm interviewed here. So it all, it's, it all becomes part of that big conversation that you're having. Um, but I just want to pick up on one thing, and I think that you said that it's really, really important about the not selling. Um, and there is a rule that people are starting to talk about now, which is the 80-20 rule. You spend 80% of your time in your social networking being helpful to people, pointing them in the direction of writer's tips, interesting stuff, World War II things, if your book's set in World War II, it's not about you and your book, it's about other stuff that readers need. You're giving them what they need. 20% is... Book too, because it's in my signature or it's in it's on my fan page and things like that, so that you don't get a reputation as a spammer. Because most people that are becoming experienced on Twitter, as soon as they get a buy my book link, you just delete them as a friend. You just think, oh, I can't be doing with that. I don't want, haven't come here to be sold to. I've come here to be in a room full of people that are interested in the same stuff as me. Um, so working your blog tour is really important, um, and it becomes part of that social networking thing. Do you, do you use social networking? Yes, I do, absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially Facebook stuff. But I also do. Um, I've been doing quite a lot of school visits. Um, you know, awesome. last year or so, I've done good twenty or thirty school visits, and my books are mainly to young adult and things, and uh, that's worked actually very well. Um, but to the point now, usually other schools have phoned up so I've a recommendation from such and such down the road. Would you come and do that that talk on, on the time travel or Anglo-Saxons at uh, you know our school and things? And uh, that's worked. Uh, if I knew, usually the the schools all agree, I don't charge the schools, I just say I'll come, you know, would you buy some books for the library, um, and they've always got, always got a budget for, you know, a few books for the library, and usually the kids will bring a bit of pocket money along and buy a few books as well, and the best I've done is 40, 40 books in, a, in one school, mm -hmm. usually it's less than that, <laughs> you know, but it, it, it helps, it all helps and builds up and things, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'm just now, just, just my published in, on uh, Kindle, um, but one of the things that I did notice, and it's in America, and I went through, as I understand it, I don't know for sure how it works over here, but I know if you go Amazon in the States, if you're going to have a, a POD, you go through their create space, and, you know, and that's, they set their price. My book uh, came out, I think its formatting uh, could have been a little tighter, but then I didn't know how to I didn't have my knowledge base to, you know, keep it tight. And so the book came out, um, 500 and some pages. And uh, I would love to have had it sold through Create Space on POD at like 7 to $9. I said, no, it's going to be 17 yeah. They set the price at seventeen twenty, and then I went ahead and set the price when it would go on Kindle. At seventeen ninety nine, because I'm a Kindle snob, and I mean I'm spoiled on being able to buy a book under five dollars. Well, and so when it starts going up that high, what? It's not my experience at all with, with uh, Kindle setting prices. Not at all. No, you can set. You can set your own. Price. You can set your own price, but uh, you can set your price on the Kindle. Yes. But you but don't the have POD to use, through you create space, space. They would not let it go. They, they will have sold them very heavily to you. And if you're under the impression that you have to use create space, then you're, that, that's not right. Then that, you, they that's are, probably they, my once venue. Once you publish on Kindle, and this is something to be aware of, create space um, is, is Amazon's um, own POD system. They will automatically set your, um, re, your, your retail price yes. and your trade discount will be a minimum of 40%. They won't let you go any lower than that. So um, immediately your economics are being affected. If you put a book up on Kindle, first of all, you will find yourself sucked into Amazon's massive machine. And I, I don't have a problem with Amazon. I think they do what they do really, really well. But they sell so hard that if you think that you had to use CreateSpace for your book, then that's a bad thing. Um, because